He's one of the most interesting uh, personalities of our time and probably one of the most innovative minds there are on planet Earth. As I was starting to read this book, I noticed something very, very interesting. That is, throughout his life, um, Job had an interest in Eastern spirituality, Hinduism, Zen Buddhism, and the search for enlightenment. As a matter of fact, he was a restless seeker throughout his life. And um, for all practical purposes, I have not yet really found anything that gives me reassurance that he ever found what he was looking for. He was continually seeking and restless. The lectureship that we have started uh, yesterday evening speaks to that theme. Namely, through the global conversation that is going on right now, where people are asking the question that we looked at briefly yesterday, uh, what's the best way to live life on planet Earth? And um, I am sure that you will not have forgotten uh, the formula that we talked about yesterday. What was it? The three words. Seeds. Deeds, weeds. Okay, so what do we do with seeds? Sow some seeds, do some deeds, and pull some weeds. Now, um, this was only the start. And this morning, we want to continue in our second lecture with the theme, the geosomes. What is your worship virtue, worldview, and world venue address. And you may wonder why Dr. Tom is using these strange new words. And I promise you that by uh, three o'clock this afternoon, you probably will be able to give a good answer to that. But just a hint, whoever creates the words is the one who controls the conversation. And I think Dr. Tom is a master in starting a conversation and leading us in a direction that is enlightening. And so I'm sure that we will be blessed this morning as we were yesterday evening. And I would like to start uh, this lecture with a prayer. Please bow your heads. Our Father in heaven, you're the one who has been restless, seeking to enter into this global conversation with all of us. And as we are gathered here this morning, I just pray that your spirit may be present in our hearts, in this room, and that you may be with Dr. Tom as he enters this conversation again with us to help us understand what is at stake in the world in which we live today and in which we are part of that global conversation as we seek to engage different cultures in what it means to live life on planet Earth the best way possible. 2,000 years ago, you came in through Jesus Christ into this world and you gave a powerful answer. And I just pray that you may help us as we try to understand how this answer is relevant even today. I thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Dr. Tom, please talk to us. Thank you, Dr. Hay. I want to frame some of the discussion today uh, in this lecture on the geo zones of the global conversation with two people one from Europe, one from South Asia. Who was the person that the Committee for the President of Harvard University, at that time Harvard College, 1634, 
the first university for America. Who was the person that the committee chose to be the first president of Harvard? And why did he turn it down? It was Jan Comenius. Jan Comenius was a man of the underground church uh, in the area which is today Poland. He was, is originally, he is a Czech. His uh, picture is on the, uh, uh, the money of the Czech Republic. Uh, he's a very fascinating person. The reason he turned down the opportunity to become the first president of Harvard is because he said he couldn't leave his work with the children he was teaching children in the underground church in Europe. If you'd like to discover some things about him, you can go to the United Nations website. There is a posting there by uh, Jean Paget, the French psychologist. And uh, <clears throat> he's quite fascinating because the European Union's adult education program for all of Europe for continuing and community-based education is called the Comenius Project. I'll talk more about him in just a moment. Savitribai Fuli, the last name is spelled P-H-U-L-E. Savitribai Fuli has been called the mother of modern education for India. Before her, the girl child was not educated in India not because there was just a lack of opportunity, but because there were presuppositions in the thinking of the leadership for thousands of years that said that women could not and should not be educated. With Savitribai Fuli and others of that generation, that changed so that today any Indian woman anywhere in the world who is an educated Indian woman owes her education to the roots with Savitribai Fuli. So I want to talk about what is called on the United Nations website by uh, Paget, the original and unusual worldview of Jan Comenius, and as a result also, as we'll see in a minute, that of Savitribai Fuli. If you want to bring about changes in educational practices or thinking, Jan Comenius and Savit Fuli may be surprisingly helpful. In the field of education, many know Jan Comenius, 1592 to 1670. They know Comenius as the father of modern European and even global education. Much fewer people are acquainted with Savit Fuli, who lived from 1831 to 1897. She is the mother of modern education for India. But most who have studied both Comenius and Savitribai agree that we are all in their debt. Mukesh Manish, professor of Hindi at, at uh, Delhi University says, modern India's first woman teacher, Savitribai Fuli, was a radical advocate of female and untouchables education. She was a champion of women's rights, a milestone of trailblazing poetry, and a courageous mass leader who stood strongly against the forces of caste and patriarchy, who certainly had her independent identity for her contribution. Indian women owe her. In today's world, whether a girl, Indian girl child reading English, an Indian woman who reads, period, or an Indian woman who is educated, or an educated international Desi woman. Her education as an Indian female grows from the garden that was planted by Savitribai Fuli. Just as no one else vies and has any real competition with Savitribai Fuli for the honor of mother of modern education for India, scholars recognize Jan Comenius as the father of modern education for the world. In Europe, the United Nations Educational Comenius Award for Outstanding Research and Innovation in Education and the European Union's Comenius Lifelong Education Program for Schools was named for him, as I've just mentioned. So then consider this question. What do the poor, 
Maharashtran Indian woman of the 1800s and the persecuted Moravian Czech man of the 1600s have in common? Answer, they are both persons who loved children and held an uncommon, uh, they held in common a most uncommon outlook, an outlook that produced culturally uncommon outcomes, outcomes that changed our global education. These two persons who are separated by centuries and cultures are actually worldview colleagues. Thus, across the calendar and across the continents, the 16 and 1800s and Europe and India, across calendar and continents, Comenius and Savitribai, working educationally from a most uncommon worldview, are today celebrated for their globally applicable intellectual and instructional outcomes. In an article, as I mentioned, posted on the United Nations Education website, Jean Piaget, uh, the Swiss philosopher and psychologist noted for his studies in the intellectual and cognitive development of children, asked this concerning Comenius. How are we to account for the fact that a theologian of the 17th century should have concerned himself with education to the point of creating a great dialectic. There are indeed many educational institutions in which certain methods have been developed and these have been described. But there has been, there was a long, that was a long way to go before building up a whole philosophy of education and centering it on still, a still broader system around it. Thinkers and philosophers from Montage and uh, rebellious to Descartes and Lip, uh, Lipnig are, are likewise made, had also likewise made profound remarks about education, but only as corollaries to their main ideas. Not only was Comenius the first to conceive a large, huge, uh, full-scale science of education, but let it be repeated, these are the words of Jean Piaget, he made it the very core of a, pansof a, a, a pansophony, a, 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 a complete philosophy, which was to constitute a general philosophic system. How can we explain so original and unusual statement in the middle of the 17th century? This is really remarkable. I spoke to a person who was a graduate of a major New York University from their school of education. We were in New Delhi. I asked what this person knew about Jan Comenius. The person said, I, I don't remember, I, I can't recall uh, anything. Whoa. Well, that's interesting. I'm just powering off. Hmm. Bro, you want to see if you can solve this? I'm, I'm going to use one, uh, one fairly crucial. Um, hmm. You think I just hit something totally? Okay. See if you can get me back on. So I'll, I'll move over here. You, you follow me. There are many people, I think, there are many things that are sometimes shifted aside in research by simply not quoting someone. You can eventually eliminate the discussion from academic journals and other things like this. What was surprising to me is that the person had a master's degree in education, but had not discussed Jan Comenius in their program. So the person, knowing that I was a follower of Jesus, said, well, but what is it? Is this your particular interest? And I said, no. Uh, my understanding, he is, uh, Jan Comenius would be central if you're going to be in the field of education. 
And um, he said, well, I never heard of him in any of my classes. So he said, why do you feel it's important? And I said, well, let me ask a question. If you studied at Yale or at Harvard and had a master's degree in philosophy, but you never had a discussion of Aristotle, would you consider that to be defective? The person said, hmm. So they said, so what do you, what is your, what is your point? Uh, who was he? And I said, well, rather than me tell you, why don't you go to the United Nations website and look him up? And so that began a conversation. All I can say is that uh, that has continued and been very fruitful. What's interesting is, is that Comenius is considered not only the, the father of modern European education, but modern education. If you research him, you'll find that if you're looking at critical thinking, if you look at age appropriate uh, uh, curriculum so that you use simple things with children and then graduate it upwardly, uh, de dealing with visual, visual aids, dealing with experiential learning, all of these things go back, according to the authorities in education, uh, back to um, uh, Comenius, uh, rather, uh, rather clearly. <laughs> Sorry about this. Whoever edits the tape, you can enjoy and just note the times and enjoy editing this. And right now. That's not a wolf, but it is a happy fox. Okay, let's see what we do. I, I think it, it, but I believe it'll pull it. All right, let's try it again. Now let's see if I can keep from turning it off. Huh? So, here's the thing. Um, give me my cutoff time on this again. I've lost my orientation. Three after ten, okay. So let me bring us back. The puzzlement of Paget about the father of European modern education, Jan Comenius, applies equally to the mother of Indian modern education, Savitribai Fuli. How can we explain so original and unusual a statement in the light of her circumstances? What was so original and unusual what was so original and unusual about these two marginal persons who caused a revolution in the planet's educational environment for children, especially the poor, the girl child, and the disadvantaged? Rosalind O'Hanlon, former Cambridge University scholar, now a professor of Indian history and culture at Oxford University, describes Fooley's main point regarding the interconnected problems of the 19th century low caste majority Indian. She says, traditional religious disabilities lay at the root of the frustration and backwardness of the low caste. These interconnected problems required a radical solution, a revolution in the worldview of the lower caste individual. In stripping the Brahmin of his religious authority and the social hierarchies of Hinduism of their religious sanction. This would free the lower caste man or woman to understand for themselves both the workings of the natural world 
and the distribution of power and authority in their own society. With precision, then, O'Hanlon draws our attention to Thule's main point, that the problems of, the ma of majority India are interconnected, that the root of those problems are the traditional religious disabilities, and that the only genuine solution would be a radical solution. Therefore, both Comenius and Savitribai had one point. It was a never surrendered single point. It was their main point, that the interconnected problems of their societies required an integrative solution, for it was the traditional religious disabilities that lay at the root of the frustration and backwardness of India's lower caste. If that is accurate, and I think it is, then I think a word about worship view, worldview, and world venue will help us see better what Savitribai and Comenius, Comenius saw so boldly. Like Comenius and Savitribai, all of us work within some cultural matrix or social system, a system with three dynamic but not disconnected dimensions, which I'm designating as worship virtue, worldview, and world venue. What do I mean by these? Many of us are, are, uh, are familiar with the word uh, worldview. A worldview is your system of thinking. Uh, I love the book, the most uh, significant book of the 1990s that I read was 1997, published by Oxford University Press, uh, Gordon Graham, uh, a, a Philosophy of History. The sh it's called The Shape of History, A Philosophy of History. I never expected that this Leeds University philosopher writing with Oxford University would describe and say what he did about worldviews. He goes through and goes, calls different things philosophies, and he, it's interesting, he says they, they become a, a whole system whenever you give four things. What is ultimate reality? What is humanity? What is mankind? What is the problem? with humanity, and what is the solution? These four things compose every worldview. Ultimate reality, humanity, what is a human being? Uh, what is the diagnosis, the, the, the diagnosis of what's wrong uh, with humanity? Every philosophy, every worldview says that there's something defective. And then what is the prescription for solution? these four things. What was interesting is, is that he started off with um, only seven, but he included everything from Aristotle and Augustine to uh, uh, modern Darwinism and Marxism. And before he was finished, I was really shocked. Here's something that nor normally you think of Darwinism being uh, something in the sciences or the social sciences. Aristotle is philosophy, Augustine is religion, Marx is economics. So why did he all put them all together? Because he said, uh, we've actually put them and categorized them in, in separate areas, but actually they're dealing with the same thing. What is ultimate reality? What is humanity? What is our human beings? What's wrong with the planet and us, and how do you solve it? These things. But what's interesting is <coughs> many people leave out an element which I've become convinced is absolutely necessary. Uh, in, in the medical field, uh, there's a writer, uh, Pellegrino, who has written extensively about being persons of virtue. So I, I'll give these definitions and then work them through and we'll see it on the, on the zones on the planet. Worship virtue is the virtuous person, the paradigmatic person who is a model, the model person of a culture. Worldview is the set of intellectual precepts, the holistic way of perceiving reality that flows from the model person. And world venue is the daily set of social pathways, the social life system of everyday customs and behaviors which flow from the worship virtue person and the worldview precepts. 
Thus, a cultural matrix is recognized by its distinctive dimensions of worship view, adoration, worldview analysis, and world venue avenues. From an interdisciplinary perspective, others have alternatively but relatedly addressed the same thing I've done. I'll talk about them in a minute. Look at the map here, if you would, of the world. <clears throat> what I want to emphasize is this. As we go forward in the 21st century, I believe that what Huntington said, I hope it's not a clash of civilizations, but certainly there is going to be a conversation of civilizations. I also agree with his insight, which he did not develop, and that is underneath every major culture is a major world religion. I want to simplify that by saying that every major world religion is related to a major individual, a person. Everything that happens on this planet in the, in the view of ideas or our, our spiritual devotion, everything on the planet happens somewhere in geography, sometime in history, and it happened with some person. It is my estimation that that point has been neglected in the literature and in the discussions. Everything happens somewhere, a piece of geography. It happened at some time in history, and it happened because of somebody, someone, some person. So look at it like this. First of all, across the planet, as an underlying element. There is something that has been enormously overlooked or dismissed as only mythology and superstitions. Maybe it, there have been superstitions and mythology related, but around the world, with no exceptions across all planets, there is an ancient understanding and belief in spirits, okay? Animism, Porteus of Cambridge University says, animism is not just the worship of spirits, it is the fearful worship of spirits. And whether you are where I live in South Asia, or if you are in Southeast Asia, if you are in North Asia, if you're in Africa, if you're in Europe, Western, or Eastern Europe, if you're in North America, South America, there is a belief around the world in spirits. And I'm not for sure. Can you see from the, uh, can you see a, a, a slight yellow thing? Okay, I can't see it from this direction. Okay, you see it. All right. Then, about 500 years before Jesus, You have the Buddha. His influence basically has been centered in South Asia, some of Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and North Asia. This is not exact, but it, it's impressionistic. It'll give you the basic understanding. Then, and I'm going to give you the entire scope of Christianity or Jesus, because it begins with a person, okay? So it began in Europe and may, remained there for a long time by when you had the time of exploration from the 1500s, then it went to both North America, South America, uh, into the Pacific, and uh, into south, uh, the southern part, sub-Sahara, uh, Africa. Before it had spread that widely, you also had the influence of Mohammed and Islam, basically forming a strip, like a belt, across 
the planet. Uh, across the central part of the, uh, of the world, you have the deserts. Basically, it went from Portugal to Persia, and then eventually uh, into India and around the coast. Uh, today, we have results of that in Malaysia and then down into Indonesia, okay? So look at it again. So you have the undergirding of spirits around the world. There is the geo zone of the Buddha. There is the zone of Jesus, the J zone. There is the Mohammed zone. And then across the world, there is also emerged a variation and derived out of the Christianized West of the secular. Okay. I'm just going to leave these up here uh, for now. I will say this. Um, secularism under pressure has repeatedly uh, tended to turn to something else. And I think that the, um, the discussion is still out of what secularism will be able to do with spirits. It's a very interesting thing that in secular America, who increasingly uh, affirms a lack of belief and commitment to God, uh, is absolutely captured, not by the good supernatural, but by the evil supernatural, so that some of the blockbuster movies deal with vampires and the evil supernatural. Americans love and are attracted to the evil supernatural. Uh, the occult uh, is on the rise in experimentation with native spirituality and other things. So there's a, there's a great question, uh, historically, if secularism can maintain itself without attaching itself to some uh, spirituality. I'll deal with that more uh, this afternoon. So let me mention uh, two or three things and then we'll have some time for question and answers. There are several people who have looked at this same kind of triad components, a common pattern. Um, for example, uh, Arun van Leeuwen, a Dutch Islamic scholar as far back as the 1960s, talked about the four earliest centers of Eurasian uh, civilizations. Uh, University of California Berkeley professor of intellectual and moral philosophy, Stephen Pepper, uh, dealt with what he called the threefold nature of continuing world hypotheses. And the African radical economist of Muslim background, Samir uh, Amin, uh, discusses the three processes that created the parallel existence of distinct tributary cultural areas of the ancient world systems. First of all, Van Leeuwen. Some half a century ago, Van Leeuwen, the, the Dutch scholar, described the meaning and the spirit of the great ancient civilizations in comparison with and in contradistinction to the biblical, prophetic, and the Greek rational strains that created Western civilization. His summary was, that the pattern of the basic four earliest centers of Eurasian civilization, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, and China, persisted without interruption for thousands of years and spread far and wide. Rooted in primordial and primitive ideas, these ancient traditions persisted at almost in a self-same theme, following the main principles that produced a basic pattern across the ancient world. The common triadic components were number one, a universal idea, number two, a very ancient religious insights and speculations, and three, subtle and varied material and social iterations. Notice, he says that we're, there was a core ideal, what I'm dealing with as a worship virtue, uh, dealing around certain gods that they had, uh, a certain uh, the manifestations of their gods. Then there was what he called 
uh, speculation, various ancient religious insights and philosophical speculations, which is the worldview. And then he dealt with what he called the subtle and varied material social iterations. There were, there were versions of the same basic thing. The second one is Pepper. Stephen Pepper at University of California, Berkeley says, my aim is simple. I'm always attracted in a book of some 400 pages or so when an author says, here it is simply. So in his words, he says, my aim is simple. It is to one, to present the root metaphor, and number two, the set of categories of each of those root metaphors, and number three, to give some idea of the general appearance of the world as interpreted through each set of categories. Notice, he says that he looks for a, a root metaphor, and once you have that metaphor of what reality and life is about and how it should be lived, then you have a set of categories. Those categories are how you think it through and discuss in your mind and develop systemically the root metaphor. And from it, he says, you get the third thing, which is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his exact words, the, um, the, idea, the general appearance of the world that happens as a result of those categories. Pepper gives four main uh, axioms to frame his generalizations. First, he says a world hypothesis is determined by the root metaphor. Second, each world hypothesis is autonomous. Just as the various areas of the world are essentially autonomous, it's not that the Buddhist world is not affected by the thoughts of Christianity as such, but it, there's root things that are there, okay? Uh, it's the same for Christianity, et cetera. The third is eclecticism is confusing, for if a world hypothesis is autonomous, they are mutually exclusive. A mixture of them, therefore, can only be confusing. Many people are saying everything is the same. All cultures are of equal value. All cultures are equal. No one can critique anything else. But there's a long-standing tradition that says this simply is not accurate. And as Pepper said some 40 years ago at UC Berkeley, they are autonomous and they are mutually exclusive. A mixture of them can only be confusing. And the fourth thing in his framework of generalizations was Concepts which have lost contact with their root metaphors are empty abstractions. If you find a culture that loses its contact with its root metaphor, then it becomes wandering and lost and eventually will disintegrate. Pepper explains, this fault is one stage worse than eclecticism and it's very likely to grow out of it. When a world theory grows old and stiff, people began to take its categories and its subcategories for granted, and presently they forget where in fact these came from, and they assume that these have some intrinsic and ultimate cosmic value in themselves. I will make an application. I have lived now for 10 years in South, in South Asia. I visit the United States usually one month a year. I have three sons. My first son, Chris, was born October the 28th. My second son, Shane, was born two years later, October the 28th. And then our third son, Matthew, was born two years later, October the mm -hmm. 14th. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, Penny, uh, our, one of our daughter-in-laws, her birthday is uh, in the first week of November, and then our granddaughter, Umiko, Heaven Umiko, uh, hers is also in the first week of November. So we come home in November, uh, come back to the United States, and our first week are birthdays for our family. And then we have, in a week or so, we have then American Thanksgiving. Uh, everyone goes and does a little shopping on the next day. And uh, then we will have an early Christmas. My wife and I return to South Asia to be with our Muslim and our uh, Hindu friends uh, at uh, the regular Christmas time. So for a decade, we have lived in Asia. 
let me say that uh, as an outsider in many ways, though obviously I'm rooted and uh, raised in an American, it's interesting to me that I think that probably most Americans would have a better understanding of their culture and their society if they understood that America has already cut itself from its roots in which the root metaphor person is Jesus. It has already accepted a different metaphor. Therefore, if you want to look at crime, disease, social conflict, other things, it would be better to look and ask what is the root metaphor. I found it very fascinating as an outsider to watch the Super Bowl game of 2012. I was also very interested since I thought that's what I saw at halftime. I was interested to see the discussion afterwards and the next day of uh, MIA giving a finger to America uh, at the halftime show. And there's a lot of discussion about this. I think it would be much simpler if people understand. What you have is you have people that think that uh, a culture that has been largely, uh, or at least significantly, uh, without uh, persistent tensions uh, socially. It has had its own uh, um, ability to renew itself and its infrastructure and, and all kinds of things like this, its education. Uh, these things are not just universals or things that happen everywhere. People who live in other zones of the planet, often their whole family will sacrifice money for one person to go into the J zone in order to obtain an education or certain benefits to bring back to their original culture and uh, back to the uh, other areas. So it would seem to me that uh, what Pepper uh, at University of California Berkeley was saying that uh, if the concepts lose contact with their root metaphors, they become empty abstractions, and people forget uh, that these are actually rooted uh, at, a, at a core place. One other thing, uh, one other person, Samir Amin. I must admit that for myself, uh, he is a new person to me. Uh, I only ran across Samir Amin in 2011. Uh, I was at a conference in New Delhi, and I, I've been utterly fascinated by the works of this African uh, intellectual. As an Afro-Asian observer, he refers to himself as a deliberate globalist. He is a Muslim radical economist with an intense analytical mind. Uh, his intellectual vision is to emphasize, and I quote him, the unequaled power of Marx's method to the analysis of global history. So I guess you could say that he is an African, radical, Muslim, Marxist. Wow, what a global world that we live in. <laughs> in laying out his framework for world history, Amin contrasts the ancient world systems versus the modern capitalistic world system. Amin sees world history flowing from civilizational tributary systems, distinct tributary cultural areas founded precisely on broad systems of particular reference, most often religious, Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, and Christianity. Tributary, tributary societies by Amin's thinking experience parallel existence. They're all on the planet at the same time, but they have parallel existences, each with a peculiar nature, living out its own particular trajectory and manifesting its own distinctive contextual existence. Does that make sense? Any person who has never been since this lectures taking place here in the United States. Any person who's not from the United States, when you arrive and get off the plane, you know you're in a different zone. If an American travels to Europe, you get off the plane and you're in a different zone. But I'll tell you, you're even in a different zone if you're in Paris or if you're in Prague. 
You can feel the difference. You know and understand some of the difference of that there's a different distinctive trajectory when you get off the plane in Moscow. So if I go to Lagos or to Nairobi, whether I go to um, um, wherever, to, uh, to Beijing, to Bangkok, it continues to be the same. Three processes create each civilization's trajectory cultural area. Number one, a universal ideology or religion based on universal values that go beyond the ideologies of kinship and, and country. Number two, an intellectual incubation. I love that phrase from Amin. An intellectual incubation. And number three, a communal crystallization with its own production techniques and webs of exchanges in goods, techniques, knowledge, and ideas. So, for this brief time together, I make this simple but all too often unnoticed, overlooked, or even ignored point that Jan Comenius, I'm coming back now, Jan Comenius and Savitribai Thule can help us relook at global education and these fields of the different areas of the geozones because they so clearly illustrate all three of the dimensions in their own cultural matrix. So then, with Van Leeuwen, Pepper, and Amin discussions in mind, here are my thoughts on worship view, worldview, and world venue. First of all, worship virtue. The worship virtue is the luminary, the person who is looked to for one's life standard. The virtu, virtu, the Italian for virtuous or excellence, is especially, especially attributed to works of art. In Italian, a virtu has to do with a painting or a sculpture that is excellent in that field. It is the, the virtu is the voice the culture listens to. It is the person of adoration. So, as the culture's person of excellence, and thus the society's worship virtue, that person sets the spiritual standard, uh, sets the standard of spiritual excellence for the aesthetic, the moral, the religious living, and shapes the habits of the heart. As Pellegrino points out, notions of virtuous and virtuous persons are universal constructs. I quote him, every culture has a notion of a virtuous person, that is, a paradigm person, real or idealized, who sets standards of noble conduct for a culture and whose character traits exemplify the kind of person others in that culture ought to be or to emulate. Three leading contemporary worship contenders are Jesus, Buddha, and Mohammed. Across history, only a, parad a paradigmatic few have remained rather constant. The shaman, Moses, Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, Jesus, and Mohammed. I'll repeat those. It is my estimate that if you will look at the at writings, whether they are philosophical, anthropological, sociological, uh, religious, you'll find that there are just a few virtuous persons, that, that is the ideal person, the worship virtue across history. The shaman, I should note this, and I'll come back to this uh, in the next hour or so, the shaman experience religiously is the most widespread religious experience on planet Earth, okay? That is uh, the direct contact with spirits. The shaman, Moses, Buddha, Confucius, Socrates, Jesus, and Mohammed. They are autonomous, mutually exclusive, and they are not all saying the same thing. But once you are within the geographical zone of any of those persons of virtue, 
that zone, that culture, those cultures have a trajectory that remains the same. For example, this is a contested statement. I'll make it anyway. You can, do, you can then uh, grapple with it. As a sociologist, I have been unable to find any society that is primarily shamanistic or has at the core the worship of spirits that is a prosperous society. It is only whenever it is invaded or overlaid with something else. Otherwise, it remains across the planet. It remains a poor, uh, from an economic standpoint, a poor culture. Worship virtue, then, is the defining allegiance given to the full or ideal and exemplary person who embodies an ideal personhood to a very high or perhaps even the highest degree, usually beyond what normal people can attain in organizing and conducting their lives. University of Helsinki's uh, Veli Mati uh, Karkin, and I may have mispronounced his name, he reminds us of his childhood in Finland. His father enthusiastically told him about new engines for cars and airplanes. The original blueprint or the model from which the actual engines would be produced, his father called the prototype. His father was emphatic. He told the little boy who listened to him, the closer the product approximates the prototype, the better the engine. From that picture, Karkainen explains the position accorded to Jesus as a paradigmatic exemplar, a worship virtue. He says, Jesus, the revelation of God, is the prototype. He is the only one among us who faithfully and per perfectly represents what God the Creator wished for the human person created in his image to be. This prototype person, then, is the blueprint of perfection by which others model their lives the exemplar and the virtuous person. Paradigm person forms the root metaphor, the primordial person of emulation. Well, who is the prototype person? Is it Krishna, Mohammed, Buddha, Jesus? In the global world, different people choose different worship virtue persons. They are each autonomous, Krishna is not saying the same thing as Mohammed. Krishna enjoys approaching him through idols, visible representations dedicated to the gods. Mohammed will have nothing to do with that. The Buddha tells one to be extracted from society. Jesus says that you are to be engaged in society. The Buddha described himself as a lone rhino wandering far from society. Jesus saw himself as the good shepherd who gathered the crowds to himself. So then they are each autonomous, mutually exclusive. They are not all saying the same thing. Now the second thing, world, world view. If worship virtue is the luminary person, then a worldview is the lens through which to look at life. Worldview is a comprehensive vision, the arrangement of analysis, a vital mindset perspective. If the worship virtue satisfies the heart, the worldview especially speaks to the head, justifying, arguing, and setting out the whole picture, giving a lens by which to see all of life in reality. A worldview, as Paul Hebert explains, is the most fundamental and encompassing view of reality shared by a people in a common culture. This mental picture makes sense to the world around them, makes sense of the world around them, and is based on fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. It clothes these belief systems with an aura of certainty that is, in fact, the way reality is. Worldviews, then, are social creations they're produced and sustained by communities of people in order to understand and live in their world. 
As such, worldviews function as, as uh, paradigms, as fields of consciousness, as research traditions or structure of assumption. As DeWitt reminds us, it is important to remember that a worldview refers to a system of beliefs that are interconnected, something like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle are interconnected. That is, a worldview is not a collection of separate and independent, unrelated beliefs, but a worldview is instead an intertwined, interrelated, interconnected system of beliefs. It is a jigsaw puzzle. It is not uh, uh, just stones uh, scattered on the ground. My point is that a careful look at worldviews will clarify that each mindset goes back to a moral luminary. Each worldview lens goes back to a moral luminary. That each world major worldview around the planet, those systems owe their roots to a moral exemplar. The last thing, a world venue. A world venue is a lifestyle. So in worship virtue, you have a luminary person. In, world, in, wor uh, in, in worship view is a luminary person. In world view is a lens perspective. And in world venue, you have a lifestyle pathway. A world venue is the lifestyle, the resultant set of social practices that are typical of any particular worship virtue worldview mix. World venue is the net of visible veins, the actualization of actions constituting a visible manifested social pattern. The worship venue is the configuration of social life, the observable, persistent differences in the global culture zones, the tangible and visible differences between the social experiences and behaviors that flow from a particular voice and vision of that society. So then, worship virtue, worldview, and world venue matrix encompasses not only the invisible realities of heart and head, but it also expresses the observable social texture the visible realities of the hands, the actualized social pathway patterns. The different cultural zones on the planet, the geozones, the meaning matrices, the multi-dimensional expressions of their worship virtue voice, their worldview vision, and their worldview veins. This truth, Comenius and Savitribai intuited with precision. By this understanding, the cultural geography of the global world can be likened to life houses, houses constructed by the craft of those virtuous few. They did not build life the same. The house that Moses built or the house that Jesus builds is not the same house as that crafted by those thinking according to the blueprints drawn up by, the fo by following the illumination, the example of the Buddha, Mohammed, or Shiva. The various worship virtues generate alternative worldviews, which evolve distinctively different world venues. For example, Savitribai's husband, Jyotiroy Fuli, the Abraham Lincoln of India, called their religiously constructed social reality of India a prison house. Um, Jyoti Roy Fooley lived at about the time of Karl Marx and Abraham Lincoln. He admired the revolution that was happening with the American uh, Civil War. And he said, slavery has been in existence all through history. And at different points of history, the slaves have raised up against their slave owners. He said, what we are seeing today, because he was a contemporary of the, Civil, the American Civil War, he was in India, he never left India. What Fooley said was, today, during the American Civil War, we are seeing something that has never, ever happened in human history. For the first time in human history, the slave owners have risen up against themselves. 
Hmm. I found that striking in its insight. History all across the planet has had slavery. Across history, the slaves have raised up against the slave owners. But only in the American Civil War did you have where slave owners rose up against themselves. And then this Indian practitioner, social activist, intellectual, spiritual man, he said, why has this happened? And his answer was, it's because of their spiritual guru, Bali Raja, the sacrifice king. Because of this, fathers are killing their sons, and sons, he used the word murder, are murdering their fathers. The slave owners are, 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 are uh, battling each other in order to free the slave. He said this has never happened. So who was this person? I will mention that Mahatma Fuli's bronze statue was erected in the parliament building in 2004. Also, on his death anniversary for 100 years, he died in 1890. So in 1990, the government of India republished his works. Who did the government of India choose to write the foreword to the works of Mahatma Fuli? They chose Nelson Mandela. They invited Mr. Mandela to come to India to inaugurate the republication of Thule's works because the intellectuals of the masses of India said that we must have the same kind of revolution that South Africa had and Dr. Nelson Mandela led in because India is the last bastion of apartheid on the planet, but it is not race-based, it is caste-based. Dr. Mandela was not able, because of his health, to travel, but he did write the foreword to the works of uh, Mahatma Fuli. So Fuli says that his India, the India that he lived in was a prison house. He pointedly describes the followers of Bali Raja in the West that they were deeply aggrieved by our misery. So they entered our prisons and they asked us, people, why are you, you are human beings just like us. Our creator and our sustainer are one and the same. You are entitled to the same rights that we have. Why do you obey the dictate of these crafty priests? Then the foolies in their cultural, their cultural house, to them their cultural house was a grinding reality made more so because they were vividly aware that there were those in other lands who lived not in prison houses, but in pleasant houses. For those other people were listening to different contending voices. They were conceptualizing different visions of the world, and they were creating different social venues of daily life, pleasant houses, as it were. By such a reckoning, different cultures provide their occupants with differing life-flourishing environments, alternative cultural zones. That is, different cultures around the world express alternative mixtures of worship, virtue, who they spiritually look to, worldview, how they analyze logically, and world venue, how they express their lifestyle. Historically, they have formed ancient and present territorial zones of contest, zones of unequal fullness of life, the geo-zones of the planet. Uh, I believe my time is about up. All I want to say, I'll, I'll just, uh, there's more, you can read this, uh, you'll read it in a, uh, a coming issue of the Journal for Applied Christian Leadership. Uh, and I will simply say this, it's a very fascinating thing that Mahatma Fuli was asked, who is Bali Raja, the sacrifice king? He says, your mothers have prayed about it in the, um, in the villages every year at Diwali. There's a time where they have an arti and they, they, they honor their husband, they worship him, and they have a prayer, may our sorrows flee away and may the kingdom of Bali Raja come. It's an ancient mythology. 
he identified this and he said, Bali Raja has come. He came long ago to a country far away. And there Bali Raja was the epitome of absolute good. He healed the blind and caused the lame to walk. He was deceived by and betrayed by the priest of his culture. They murdered him. They crucified him. But he told his disciples to go everywhere. And those followers of Bali Raja went to Europe, to the British, those primitive British who became noble once they followed Bali Raja. And his followers went to North America. He said, now those followers of Bali Raja have come here with a message of liberation. When they come, listen to them. Someone said, Bali Raja is a title, sacrificed king. Does he have a name? In the Marathi, he said, yes, his name is Yashwant, which means the victorious one. They said that also is a title. Who is he? And Mahatma Fuli said, he is that guru of the Westerners who teaches them, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So the father of social revolution for India, he and his wife were the first person in the some 3,000 year history of India to ever educate the backward caste and the girl child. They did it because of the person of virtue, Bali Raja, the sacrificed king, Jesus. That gave them a different way to think about who they were and who children were. So then they were the first Indians to have the Indian-owned school. Missionaries, foreigners had had others, but they were the first Indians to have their own school at teaching the girl child and the backward caste. And it led to different venues or different activities, namely the establishing of universal education and such as this. So the point is, is that if you can locate a person's worship virtue, who is the person of virtue, you will find that then a person begins to think a certain way. According to how they think, they will then create actions or a venue in which you will then live out society in a different way. What we have here then is the same thing. You have across the world a belief in spirits which has its effect. There is the zone of Buddha. There is the zone of Jesus. And there is also the zone of Mohammed. These are the major geo zones of the planet. I'll stop here. Questions or comments? In fact, I'm going to do the same thing here. We have just a, a few minutes. Turn to a person next to you and uh, uh, give at least one thing that has been uh, helpful or has raised a question for you in the things that I've talked about. You and two other people, if you would, groups of three approximately. What is one thing that has been helpful or one thing that has raised a question? It was. Okay, give me some feedback, if you would. What thoughts do you have? What comments do you have? What questions do you have? Yes. Hmm. Maybe it wasn't a question. I thought, thought I 
That's not a question. Uh, I'm dealing with uh, why lumping Hinduism and Buddhism, they are not the same. Uh, that is very definitely so. I'm actually doing it just for simplicity here. Uh, Hinduism by its nature is only practiced on one place on the planet, and that is South Asia, because it is caste born. Reincarnation in Hinduism is an understanding that when you are born, reborn through karma, you are born into a caste. And whatever your father was, that's what you do. That has been, uh, that has been broken into by the exposure to the Western world since the 1500s. Now then, that is more and more being disassociated from its past and is being abstracted uh, which we have the imports here through, for example, Deepak Chopra and others, all the programs of yoga and such as this. Everyone understands in India that yoga, which is the Hindi word from which we get our English word yoke, a yoking together, a, a yoga, is an ancient spiritual practice, but we have hatha yoga and other things which are supposed to be only exercise and everything like this. In India, everyone understands it's always linked to spirituality. But it's being abstracted, and that is largely, in many ways, being absorbed into a Buddhistic, uh, Buddhaistic uh, mindset. So whether it is Richard Gere or Brad Pitt or something like this, but the, the, the more generic. And um, uh, so you will find that today in Hindu India, that opposed the Buddha, okay, because he would allow anyone to meditate, not just Brahmins, but anyone to meditate, in the international airport, the new airport that's about mm, three years, four years old, in New Delhi, you have uh, about a two-story high head of the Buddha. So I think that even within India, India is now um, marketing the Buddha as the expression of their abstract understanding in order to break out of caste India. That's my take on it. How many of you for how many of you is this, uh, uh, is this your first time to hear a discussion of persons of virtue? Okay. Persons of virtue, for many of us. The medical field has uh, had this, uh, Pellegrino as a person to go to, but I, when, one of the things that I'm really interested to critique and to introduce is the fact that the way people deal with their worldview is based upon a person. Find the person. Find the person, and you'll find how people think. Show me the person of adoration, I'll show you your method of analysis where you begin to draw implications, and that will give you your actions. Yes? Where what has taken place? Mm -hmm. How do you find the root person, the, the person of virtue, when the syncretism has happened? You find that, you find it at the points of crisis. You find it at the points of push and shove. And that's why you will have around the world, for example, at the point of difficulty or disease, Many times, people who say they're Christian, they'll go to a shaman. Does that make sense? And so they, they will opt out into that. 
or uh, persons in secular environment will say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus, but actually under pressure, they may do, make very secular decisions that have nothing to do with Jesus because they opted out. I'm going to talk about that in the next one, that, that secularism, however, is always a motel and never a house. It, it's waiting to move somewhere. Um, yeah, someone else. Let me say this. I, I did an article here at the uh, international, uh, the first international Buddhist conference in Mumbai in 2005, and it was published um, uh, in uh, one of the books there. I made the point that one thing that contemporary Buddhism has to, to deal with is that Buddhism has never, in its, in its traditional history, Buddhism has never eliminated superstitious and spirit thinking. It has always incorporated it. So though you have many times people will say that Buddhism doesn't believe in God, but Buddhism always includes the gods. So in the temples and such as this, there's always spirits. If you follow uh, Thomas, uh, publishing with Oxford University Press, oh gosh, it might be somewhere back in the 70s or so, about, wit about magic and such, the only place that spirits have been uh, evicted from the, from the uh, apartment, okay, their lease is up, has been in the J zone, in the Jesus zone. Now, that's not, again, in the Catholic zone, but in the Protestant zone. Consistently across history, spirits have been pushed back only in the Protestant version of Christianity, the Bible version of Christianity, because the Jesus of history is the one who exercises uh, spirits. When you deal, for example, with spirits around the world, an exorcist will call upon some power by the spirit, you know, Mama Boo Boo or someone or, or whoever, there, they are Yung Tsai He, there will be a higher spirit that cast out this spirit. But what happens is then you, you take on that, that greater spirit has control over you. So that throughout the occult and the exorcism literature on the planet, every exorcist calls upon a higher power to do an exorcism. There is only one exception to this, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is unique in the literature of exorcism because he alone never called upon a higher power. He spoke directly to spirits and said, <clears throat> I'm speaking to you. And Jesus, by his own authority, spoke to spirits. It is the claim of Christians then, that's why in the cross and the resurrection, he demonstrated who he was. And that's why in any language, in any culture, in any period of history, spirits always know who Jesus is. So at the name of Jesus, you can exercise spirits. That is the only place where that has been done historically. And that is why Francis Schaeffer said that Northern Europe and the, the zone of the, of the Protestant Reformation was where the bonfires of the gospel had burned bright, but now under a secularist generation, the bonfire had gone down and in a cold night, there were only the embers and around in the darkness, there was <laughs> You can hear the animals circling in the night as the bonfire of the gospel burns down. A very interesting uh, image. So I think that uh, just as Larry King, uh, I'll just wait for the next one, but Larry King live, remember a few years ago, had uh, a discussion about uh, people with paranormal uh, giftings and such. And it's a very interesting thing to see again that uh, a whole phenomena is coming in because uh, spirits actually form a base across the entire world. Uh, secularism has not discussed that. But in the global world, I think we're going to have new discussions about that. Okay, I think our time is finished. Dr. Eric.
you are Seventh-day Adventists, you probably resonate with what uh, we have just heard from Dr. Tom. Um, how many of you are aware that the Adventist Church has added a new fundamental belief? Okay, most of you. Uh, what is it about? It has to do, well, they call it the devotional life or the spiritual life of a person. But what does it really deal with? Well, it deals with the reality that we as Westerners have had to come to grips with. That when we go into the other zones, we are confronted with different realities for which we don't have any answer because we in the West, in secular Europe, in secular America, we have been educated out of even being aware of the spirits. But the person that comes out of these zones, whether it, it be Buddhist, Muslim, etc., you go to Africa, that is uh, Muslim Africa, but there are animists underneath. So the spirits are very much aware uh, or alive in those, in those areas. But we as the Adventist Church, we, we did not really provide any tools for those who became Christians. And one of the reasons why these believers came back to us was that they said, look, what do we do with the realities around us? You go to Thailand, you rent a house. Dr. Tom, you know that. And what's his, what is in your garden? There is a spirit house. And who lives there? Well, according to your neighbors, the spirit, the local spirit, lives there. What does he do? Well, when you build, you take the territory away from the spirit. So you give him a house to keep him happy, and you actually feed him. And it doesn't matter how educated you are. Deep down inside, you know that reality because you have been born into it, and you live with it, you grow with it. And your intellectual upbringing, whether it's university or just uh, primary school, does not change that reality unless you're being touched by somebody who comes to you and says, there is somebody that is bigger than the spirits and that will free you from it. But we as Westerners, as even as Western Adventists, we have not had that answer. But now in the 28th belief, which is which one? The 10th now in actuality, we have addressed that problem after studying it, after realizing that many of our converts in those zones actually fell prey to what we call split, a uh, split level Christianity. And that's one of the things that we actually discuss in uh, your mission classes. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at uh, a quarter to 11. And then we'll go into the next um, lecture.